Hello. Welcome to another episode of the Corporate Cowboys Podcast. Today is Monday, April 25th, 2022. Just a little proof of life, you know. My name is Alex. I'm your host, as always. Today's episode is um, about overcoming imposter syndrome. What the fuck is it? How do I get over it? That sort of thing, you know, you know, you know. I think this happens a lot in uh, instances where people are put out of their comfort zone. And when they engage a learning curve, you know, it's uh, in some instances, it's a, it's a steep incline. I mean, it's work. It's additional work, work that they are unfamiliar with. And so this feeling of, damn, do I even belong here? You know, starts to set in. You start to feel, well, some, some start to feel like they don't belong, like they are lesser than, like they are not worthy of the position that they've worked for in order to continue working and developing professionally, personally, socially, what have you, whatever whatever the circumstances. Overcoming imposter syndrome necessarily requires you to actively work to move out of that space, to move ahead of that space, to get over the learning curve to get past those few couple days, weeks, or months, whatever the span of time, to move out of that period, out of that trial period, and into stability, into familiarity, to the point that you know what you're doing, and you grow a little comfortable. You become dependable. You become knowledgeable. And necessarily no longer an imposter. Now, I guess there is this notion of fake it till you make it. When the imposter syndrome manifests. And there are some individuals who fuck up the bag tremendously just tremendously fucking it up where they're not experienced they're not at an advanced level of uh, operation and still they fucking slack off they don't attain any level of competency And then they bitch and they whine about how they feel like an imposter and they feel like they don't deserve it. Those are necessarily actions of theirs that have given rise to consequences. They're consequences of their inaction for not having worked on themselves, not developed themselves to be more competent not develop themselves professionally in order so that they might be dependable so that they're knowledgeable and effective in their role in whatever place they might find themselves in life be it an organization some group meeting social event I actually encountered this uh in school, in school, not so much in the professional setting because, you know, when money's on the line, when money's on the line, I feel like collaboration, people are more inclined to collaborate with one another and be sure that the product gets out and be sure that the product is, uh, is stamped by all the members. But in school... In school, I encountered that the most. And more so with females. 
more so with uh, with bitches, male or female, but bitches, hoes and tricks, who would go out and uh, not party, but like would just fumble the bag, man, fumble the ball, not do their work during the week, and then when important deadlines would come up, they had nothing to show for the time that had passed. So they weren't making any progress academically. They weren't putting forth a a, a sincere effort to learn or or get ahead or improve their grasp on the material and instead would whine and bitch to professors, to school counselors, to mental health, quote-unquote mental health advisors about, oh dear, all of this stress that's come upon my life, woe is me, I have no time to work on this assignment, life has just come at me all at once, and of course, of course, because they can put on a good act, maybe squeeze out a few tears, they're given clemency, they're given leniency, right? They're given an extension on the deadlines. They can turn them in and there's still shitty, shitty submissions, right? But because of, uh, um, because of corroboration, I guess, this was more so liable to occur in undergrad because of the corroborative systems that exist in undergrad, specifically because your fucking name is on the paper, the professor knows who came to them and fucking bitched and whined and cried. So when that paper submission comes in late, they know to take it easy on them. Oh, poor, poor little bitch made student. Oh, gotta take it easy on them. Gotta, gotta fucking pad them. Gotta insulate them from from the consequences of their real life actions. Well, a lot of those students have since graduated. A lot of those students have since gotten positions of employment and uh, and are still fumbling the bag. They've taken those habits from school and have began to deploy them, use them in the workplace. And that might be why you hear a lot of boomers and Generation X and why whining, uh, uh, starting to gripe about Gen Z and millennials don't have a good work ethic or whatever, or or, or don't know how to uh, how to uh, initiate good work product or follow through on good work product. I get it. I get it. I fucking went to school with it. I worked with it. I'm familiar with it. I've had to, I mean, I wouldn't so, I wouldn't say so much I've had to check them, but in my mind, I checked them off, meaning that I know if I face them down now in real life outside of school, they're easy. They're easy game. They're prey. I, they, their prey, that makes, I mean, that makes me the predator, right? Because I seen them fucking up. I seen them stumbling. I mean, I would tell them, I'd warn them once or twice, like, well, maybe you shouldn't go out what X or N number of times a week, right? Maybe you should focus on this. Maybe you should read that. Well, have you started, have you started the project, right? Have you started your piece of the work product that needs to be submitted for this group project? And of course, I would get brushed off. And I, I want to say a lot of that has to do with age. I did return. Like I said, I was a re-entry student. And I returned to school a little later than most. So I'm a few years over the average age, right? But I've seen life. I've seen and lived maybe half of the shit. I've, 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 <laughs> I've lived... I've lived half of the shit and seen the rest, man. Um, and and having to tell them that, I mean, without 
necessarily lecturing them on what the consequences will look like. I did do my best to warn them that in my own way that maybe they should do or follow this, you know, suggested course of action so that their workload is, uh, appears lighter or that their workload is better distributed or that they're able to better mitigate life, quote unquote, life stress, which really it's just self-perpetuated. They put themselves in shitty ass situations. It might be a fucking, uh, uh, a, a dating situation like, oh my God, I can't find a good, uh, a good man or uh, I'm, like my girlfriend is, is nagging me or some shit. And I'm like, well, if you reprioritized and were able to, uh, address these issues first with yourself and then with those external factors, I feel like they would be better able I feel like you would be better able to mitigate this stress before it occurs and anticipate it. Anticipate it so that it doesn't cause too extreme of an effect on you, right? But my words would fall on deaf ears. I could only be so professional. I could only be so diplomatic, right? Until the fucking grades come out and... uh, then we gotta part ways, regardless of, regardless of uh, what, what, what they want to know from me. Oh, how did I do? What, what were my grades? How did I manage to get such good grades? Oh, now they're gonna turn around and fucking talk to the professor and bitch and whine about how life stress didn't allow them to, to receive a similar grade like I might have. But you know, it is what it is. In corporate, it's different. In corporate, you can. You could actually put the steel to work. You, you could you could actually put their steel to the test. You could actually test their metal. You can fold them. You can fold them and end their fucking career. That's what I love about corporate. See, I, I gotta end. I gotta end this episode with return to corporate, return to center. Because without corporate, everything you learn in school remains a lie. But it's perceived that is the truth. That's the disservice that public education does for you. In corporate, all those dumbass bullshit, all that dumbass bullshit strategy, like crying and whining, doesn't work to the manager because in corporate, you're only as valuable as the value you create. And if what you create are fucking bottlenecks, backlogs, late work product, shoddy quality work, nobody's going to want to employ you. Matter of fact, people will not only blackball you, but people will do others the favor of knocking you out of the game. I mean, shit, that's what I got into corporate for. It's not so much finding the ones who fuck up but readily identifying the ones who fuck up and taking care of them. To me, they're loose ends. To me, they're loose strings, untied shoestrings. So you either gotta lace those bitches up, you either gotta sew them in, or you gotta do away with them. You gotta find a way to pick them off. You have to find a way to minimize or eliminate that slack because those motherfuckers become liabilities. And in school, they full-heartedly, wholeheartedly believed that because they were able to secure an extension on the back of a couple tears, whining and crying, and, and you know, I don't know how many of their parents fucking died throughout the school year. I don't know how many breakups they were going through that they had to use to justify to whatever counselor or academic advisor that would fucking listen to them and pull a couple of strings with the professor in order to secure that extension. To them, they think that's an asset. They believe that's that's a, a positive attribute of professionalism. 
being able to secure extensions. Bro, if you, fam, if you continue securing extension after extension, the work never gets done. Nobody fucking wants you on the team if the work never gets done. If you continue securing extensions. Extensions where there is a reasonable, a justifiable cause to extend, that could be handed out to anybody, to anyone. But if you abuse that ability, and sure, I'll call it an ability, it becomes less and less positive. And it has less and less utility. And it creates less and less value. So it's not creative. It's not productive. It actually borders on counterproductivity. So you do the math. If you ain't creating, you're necessarily destroying. If you ain't producing or reproducing, you're necessarily not producing. You're counterproducing. Nobody wants a piece of shit parasite on the team. Slacking, benefiting off of the group work. And at the same time, contributing nothing, taking time, resources, money off of the table, and being insincere about it. How do you get over imposter syndrome? Easy. You grow out of it, you develop. You become what others fear you might be, a professional. You get over imposter syndrome through work, growing comfortable, being uncomfortable. You have to be uncomfortable. You have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Otherwise, you're just going to stagnate. You're not going to work because it's hard. You're going to chalk it up to stress. And you're going to procrastinate. You're going to push off deadlines and and, and request, (laughs) request extensions. Request easier chores, easier duties, less duties. You're going to want less responsibility, less accountability. And yet... You're going to bitch and moan about not having power, not having authority. Those are the consequences of your actions. That's you wanting to rationalize inactivity. That's you wanting to rationalize being inactive as activity. Like by you having done nothing, you did something. Don't fall into that trap. And it's a trap. It's re- it really is a trap. You know who's at the end of that trap? You know who's uh, <laughs> you know who's trapping? <laughs> Motherfuckers like me. Corporate cowboys. Have a nice afternoon.